spinning. So you are live, Bob. He says the broadcast is live. I'm going to take them at their word and, and act like we are live. Uh, and I guess there were like 100 people here waiting for me to come on and make my pronouncements. That's kind of this. First, that's very scary that there's any place in the world for a guy like me just to have people waiting for him to make announcements and that you're all there. <laughs> what's what's going on here? At any rate, I'm glad you're all here. Each and every one of you, I am very, very grateful that you are here and willing to put up with an old fart in the desert. Uh, that's That means a lot to me. Thank you so much. And maybe you should get a life. <laughs> no. Uh, I think that uh, we here are offering the best possible life. I really do believe that with all my heart. I may be deluded. I might be an old fool, but that's what I believe. Uh, and so by coming here, you've come. And I've heard from a lot of you that said it's true. Uh, I did all this weird stuff you said, and my life is better than ever. And I hope that's true for you. It's almost the end of the year, almost the end of 2020. <laughs> Do I hear a, a big hallelujah out there? <laughs> I think, my goodness, what a year it's been, huh? I mean, just unimaginable, unimaginable stuff happened, literally. You know, not, none of us, a uh, few of us are old enough to remember the, pa the pandemic in 1918. So that's all new and this uh, unrest and the politics and politics, luckily, we've never, ever seen before. Well, that's probably not true. Every so often I read politics from back in the 1800s and the early 1900s, and they, we had some pretty, pretty wild political times. So maybe this isn't so very unusual Pol politically, but it's, uh, it's a, been very different for most of us, I guess. But it's almost over. It's almost a new year. And so uh, maybe it's a new year for a new you. I hope so. I hope this is a new year for a new you that you can, you know, I believe that at any time you can start, just stop. It takes courage. It takes a lot of courage. Uh, but anytime you can just stop and start your life all over again. And I wish that for you. If your life isn't all you want it to be, I wish it was. So, all right. Um, but if you followed any of my advice and you are uh, thinking about becoming a nomad or you are a nomad, one of the things you deal with right away is cold and heat. Boy, that's the first thing you notice when you're a nomad. So uh, we'll get started on that topic. Uh, we'll do questions and answers. And if that doesn't last long enough, we'll just answer anything you got, you questions you have. <laughs> but first, I have to torture you all. This is the torture segment of the hour. Uh, I got to torture you all with the dreaded announcements. So let the torture begin. All right, I'll try to I'll try to get through this. I say that every time, and it's always fifteen minutes. And we'll see if we can't get it through a lot faster than that. Okay. Uh, first, uh, and I'll try and say this again because a lot of people are turning in late because they already know I'm going to be boring, boring Bob out there blithering away on the um, on the announcements. Uh, Every year at in the winter, when I come to Quartzsite, I'll be in Quartzsite next week, uh, hiding. Let me say that. I'm hiding. Uh, I try to get interviews shot for the entire year. In other words, by the time I leave the desert in next April or May, uh, I want to have shot and shot. And, I want to have shot 52 uh, videos, tours. And as you know, probably have noticed, I put out one every week on every Friday. And so I need 52 to get through the year. And most of my summer and fall and spring, I am gone and not around other people. So when I'm here in Quartzsite, I want to get them all shot and have them in the can and ready to go. Because I think the tours and the interviews are the most important thing I do. Just seeing, you know, if you, this guy or this gal can do this and and he or she is uh, 70 or 80, and if they can do it, I can do it. And uh, I think that's really important. And then how they're doing it, you know? I think that's so important. And so I, I love doing tours, and uh, we'll do try and do 52. All that to say, if you want to be interviewed or toured by me this winter, we'll follow COVID safety. Uh, if I come in your rig, I will wear a mask. I don't know that you have to wear a mask, 
uh, it's your rig. I mean, it's everything that's from you is in there, but uh, I will always wear a mask if I'm in your rig and will maintain six feet otherwise. Um, and we'll be outdoors nearly all of it, except when we're in the rig. So uh, we can keep maintain COVID safety and you can contact me at crvlinterviews at gmail.com. If you will write that, we will get you on a list and we will plan on shooting a, um, a tour and interview with you. If you need to be in the area around uh, Yuma to Quartzsite to Parker, I will bounce around in there. I know I'll go down to Algodona sometimes, so I'll be in the Yuma area. Um, I'll probably spend the majority of my time in Quartzsite and, and Parker. Of course, you have to move every 14 days, so I'll be moving. Um but uh, probably in that area, maybe over towards Bows. I do. There's some really beautiful camps over at Bows. I might like to go over there. So we'll bounce around. Uh, but it'll be in that area, and you have to come to me. Um, let me not into my camp. My camp will be secret. Uh, there, are a lot of people want to meet me. I don't know why, um, but there are. Strangely enough, one of a lot of people that want to meet me, and so. Um, I keep my whereabouts hidden. I apologize, but it's just what I have to do for my own mental, uh, emotional, and even physical health. I just need, I need that separation. So I will hide. Um, I will be in the courtside area until the end of January. Uh, and so call and write, and then I'll be in somewhere else. So you can, you can just call and uh, you can't write, you can't call. You have to write C R V L interviews i-n-t-e-r-v-i-e-w-s at gmail.com real simple just drop us an email and we'll set something up you'll hear back from us all right so that's going on i'm one i'm looking forward to hearing from you and uh emergency fund is still there if you are a nomad and you need you're in a desperate site situation and you need help we're here to help you at homes on wheels alliance so email you just send out an email that's all you have to do Email efund at homesonwheelsalliance.org. You write all that out, homesonwheelsalliance.org. Uh, wheels is plural. Otherwise, it's just spelled the way it sounds. Uh, and if you want to contribute so the money maintains in the emergency fund for the future, maybe you'll need it one day. Uh, go to howa.rallyup.com. Howa is the abbreviation Homes on Wheels Alliance. H-O-W-A dot rallyup, R-A-L-L-Y-U-P dot com. All this will be down in the description. Go down there. Uh, the RTRs, or there will not be a physical RTR this year. There will be a virtual uh, RTR. In other words, we're going to offer the classes. There are 13 classes over seven days. Uh, there will be one at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. They will be live on the Homes on Wheels Alliance YouTube channel. You can go watch them live. And uh, after the teaching session, I think that's half an hour, there will be a 15-minute um, uh, oh, question and answer session. So you can you can get questions in and, and have your questions answered. That's really good. You can chat during that time the, at the end after the teaching. So uh, go there and um, – Go to the RTRs, uh, go to the home, the Homes on Wheels Alliance YouTube channel, and uh, there's a schedule for the specific classes, the sp specific teachers. What we've tried to do this year is to invite uh, other YouTubers. Uh, I'm a big believer in collaboration. Uh, if I don't believe that uh, it's a zero-sum game, if I... If you gain, I lose. That's not the that's not the way to look at life, as far as I'm concerned. If I gain, you gain. If you gain, I gain. That's the way I like to look at my life, and I would encourage each of you to at least consider that possibility. Uh, it just makes so. If if in life, I'm only happy when I succeed, and I'm sad when you succeed, that is not a good happy life. But if I am happy when we all succeed, then I magnify, multiply by huge amounts my possibilities of being happy and contented. So your success is my success. That's the way I try to look at life. Don't always succeed, but try. So there will be other YouTubers that will hold these classes. Uh, there are experts in their different uh, di different various fields. I will teach one class. Go to the Homes and Wheels Alliance YouTube channel. You'll find it there. The schedule, the info is at homesonwheelsalliance.org. You go there, you'll find the schedule. You'll know the classes you want to mark and be at. 
the classes will replay. They will be live, and then they will replay um, on the YouTube, uh, YouTube, the Homes on Wheels Alliance YouTube channel. So you can watch them there forever. It's not like you have to see them in live or you never see them. We will also uh, play them on my channel, all all thirteen over seven days, uh, on my channel. Or I think we're doing that. I'm not exactly sure. I, the details. Oh. That's I'm told that's correct. Uh, and so you can go there and you can see them all on my channel. They'll be uh, amended. They'll be uh, briefer. I think we're going to keep them 15 to 18 minutes instead of the whole thing. So for the whole thing, go to the Homes on Wheels Alliance channel or watch them live. But this will get them all out and you'll find them where they are. All uh, They'll have uh, ads run through them and all income from those on on my channel, my channel is monetized, of course, and all income from that will go to Homes on Wheels Alliance. So if you go and watch it and on my channel, and uh, my channel is so much bigger that they will be a lot more per, you'll make a lot more money for Hawa. If you watch it on my channel and you watch some of the commercials, then that money will all go to Hawa. It will, every penny will go to Hawa. Okay. Uh, now, because we're not doing a virtual, we're only doing a virtual RTR, we're not doing a physical gathering, we encourage you to camp together to find each other. To come to the Quartzsite, Yuma, Parker, Lake Havasu area, there's going to be tons of us. And you can, you got to be bold, but you'll find people that look just like you in the same kind of rigs and uh, go up to them and say, hey, my name is, and uh, you know a guy named Bob? <laughs> Start out like that. I mean, you can't go wrong and they'll say, ooh, uh, that weirdo? Then you'll, you'll know something, won't you? Um, but, you know. If, forget me, just go up and make friends and be friendly. And that's the goal of the RTR is community and tribe and friendship. And so come to this area if you're a nomad and make friends. To arrange to camp together with nomads, we have two, two facilities. We have a Facebook group called We Camp Together. And we also, and that is on, I'll give you the, uh, how to find it, facebook.com slash groups. It's a group slash we camp together that's all you have to remember or just go to facebook on the search bar type in we camp together and it should come up also on my forum uh, cheaprvliving.com slash forums plural uh, we have a thread of where you're camping and how you can meet together get together and and uh, do that and of course, the classes are go ongoing, not just at the RTR. We have constant classes. We have constant uh, uh, fireside chats, just chances to visit. Uh, go to meetup.com slash caravans to learn, find the classes we offer year round now. And also the uh, virtual caravans, uh, virtual care, uh, campfires where you can just meet and visit and get to know people. Uh, meetup.com slash caravans, M E E T U P dot com slash caravan spelled plural just sounds like it sounds all right i'm almost there that is almost there okay um now we're not going to do a physical rtr we cannot do an rtr with with covid with its uh, big surge all the traveling going on i don't want to be responsible for a super spreader event of a of a gathering so uh, i can't my conscious i don't want that on my conscience that's uh, very selfish of myself i just don't want that harming people on my conscience that's just not how i want to live i don't want to live with that the rest of my life so instead we're canceling the, the gathering physical gathering but here's something i personally am doing and my friend sue ann carlson who is the executive director of Hawa, is personally doing uh i'm going to go camp in quartzite and i'm going to put out the location i'm not going to be camping there because i need my privacy i just don't have the mental physical, emotional energy to be surrounded by people all the time. I've got to get away and recover, my recharge my batteries. I just can't do it. I'm going to be in hiding in the area, and I will come over to, um, to camp, uh, and I'll give you a location, and you can all just camp all over. It's going to be out scad and wash, if you know Quartzsite at all. Past RTRs have been out scad and wash. It'll be in one of those uh, same locations. We had it at this location, I think, for eight years uh seven or eight years be the same one and you can go camp there it's a big area you can spread out all along scadden wash i will i will let you know when i will be at scadden wash at the old rtr site and you can come and meet me and uh i'll be there and but th that's not the goal the goal isn't to meet me it's to make friends and build community 
if you're all out there in this area, uh, chances are that you're friends. You should get to know each other. You should be bold and go say, hey, my name is, and um, I'm kind of looking to meet Bob. Do you know who he is? And or that You know, just something to break the ice or just start with the weather. Can't go wrong with the weather. Crazy weather where we're having, huh? Uh, and also at the same time, my friend Sue Ann Carlson will do the exact same thing. Not at the same time, a little bit before. My friend Sue Ann Carlson will do the same thing for women only out on Plamosa Road. We had a women's RTR there one year. And so uh, you can go there for uh, and cap with the other women. Same thing. This is not a, an organized event. There will be no activities. There will be no schedule. There will be no teaching. It's camping, recreational camping only. Recreational camping only. Nothing else. We're out camping and are going to be camping in the same area. I'm going to be there. If you're there, we can meet. And if you're not there, we won't meet. Nothing else. Same thing with the with the uh, <clears throat> women's with uh, Sue Ann. Uh, okay. I am going to be from January 28th to February 3rd. That's January 28th through February 3rd. Come camp with Bob January 28th, February 3rd. No activities, no organization, just recreational camping. Uh, Sue Ann will be uh, off Plumosa Road. January 21st through the 26th. Uh, you can find information about her gathering, not her gathering, her camp, her recreational camp on her Facebook page, which is Sue Ann Carlson Facebook page. So go there. Sue Ann Carlson Facebook page. All right, I think I'm done. No more. All right. So we're going to talk about uh Winter camping, and I have, I have questions. Some of you have written que in questions already, and I will um, just talk about uh, if you're a nomad, how to stay warm in the winter. That's basically what we're talking about here. Um, so the most important thing is to be a, a, a snowbird, if at all possible. And I know some of you can't be snowbird. So this is advice number one. Rule over overcomes everything else is to be a snowbird. Mm -hmm. Move up into the cold. Uh, in, in the summer, when you want the coolness, move out of the cold into the heat, which is either Florida or the desert, uh, in, the, uh, in the winter. So it's just be a snowbird. Follow the snowbirds. Uh, if they fly south for the winter to somewhere warmer, that's what you're going to do. And if they fly north to have their young and, and to fatten up over the summer, that's what you're going to do. You, know, maybe, you probably aren't going to be having any young. or fat, You might fatten up, but you're not going to have any young. Um, and so it, you just be a snowbird and it's easy to do, uh, one year you don't have to drive thousands of miles and it's easy to think, well, that's so far. I got to go all the way up to Montana or I got to go to Alaska to get cool. Not true at all. Uh, one year I spent the whole year, this was back in, I think 2014, I could be wrong, but back in that time frame, I spent the whole year in Arizona just to satisfy myself that I could be comfortable with the temperatures and never have to drive more than 300 miles. And I did it. So uh, winter in Quartzsite or in Yuma or in Parker or Lake Havasu, those are all warm places. They're basically all the same temperature. You could even go over to, uh, you could even go over to, what's the name of that town? I forget the name of that town. Uh, you can even be over near, fairly near Phoenix, not real close to Phoenix, but kind of closer to Phoenix and be warm. Uh, basically warm November through February or March. Then you get into the spring and it's starting to get hot and October can be hot and March and April can be hot. So, uh, but you've got good three or four months of pleasant, mostly pleasant weather. We do get rain. We do get cold. Uh, you know, it's even snowed very rarely down there. Not on, I've not seen snow where I camped, but I've seen snow on the mountains on a really exceptionally cold year. Uh, but that's very unusual. It can be cold. It can be very windy. It can be rainy. Um, come prepared for cold because it can be cold. 30s. Uh, I've even seen it in the 20s in the quartzite area. So it can be cold. The desert, once that sun goes down in the desert, it gets cold. So come ready for cold. But you're not, you know, it's not like Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, or New York or Montana or even Seattle. The cold, dreary misery of Seattle. Uh, it's a hundred times better. So even though it will be cold occasionally, you can cope with it pretty well. 
So, uh, and then I spent the whole summer up in the Flagstaff, Williams, Sholo, Payson, all the way over to Snowflake uh, and St. John's. That there's called the Mogollon Rim. Is uh, it's a huge uplift and it's very high country, from six five six thousand up to nine thousand. That part of Arizona gets up to nine thousand feet. You can be very comfortable. So and you have to move every fourteen days. So you just kind of move around. It's kind of shaped like a banana from uh, the, the Grand Canyon up near the Utah border all the way over to the uh, the New Mexico border. Just kind of this curve, a smile up in northern Arizona, and it's all high. It's up in the beautiful Ponderosa Pine Forest. And, uh, fantastic place. So all you'd have to, and it's like 300 miles. So you don't have to drive thousands of miles to be a snowbird. Another place you can do it exactly like that is California. Because in California, you can go down to Slab City, uh, which is, and some, or, or, or uh, Death Valley, and actually be below sea level, the warmest place on earth, I think is Death Valley. You could camp in that area. Uh, and then, for example, from Death Valley over to Mammoth Springs, Mammoth Lakes, uh, 150 miles, two, less than 200 miles. So you're up at 7,000 feet in the summer, and then you're down at below sea level in the winter. And that's not traveling far. California is too expensive to live in. So that's not what I would ever do, but you can do it. Arizona isn't the only state. So your first choice is to be a snowbird. If you can't be a snowbird, that's where the rest of the today's advice comes in. Now I'll start answering questions. Uh, Sproser, Mike Sproser, just spent Exodus with my family in Sandy, Oregon, trying to make it to Quartzsite without hitting snow. Good luck. Currently coming down the coast. That's your best shot. Yeah, you should do it. I'd like your advice because I know you might make a similar trip this time of year also. Yeah, I just drove. I've been... Uh, I spent Christmas with my sister and mother. You might have seen that live feed with my mom uh, just last week. That was last week. Uh, Christmas just got over. And I just drove from Medford, Oregon, down to Prump. I'm in Prump, Nevada here for briefly. I like Prump. I st spend some t lots of time in Prump. Um, it's cold here. That's generally why I don't stay in Prump for too long. It's cold here. Uh, I did run into snow and it's really hard not to run into snow. The only way you're really sure of not running into snow is taking 101 down the coast. Uh, otherwise you go over passes and the passes have snow actually Northern Nevada in the winter is going to get snow. It should be an unusual year. I drove down I five through Sacramento over took 80 over Donner pass uh, I took it because I watched the weather really closely and I knew it was a sunny day. We had a break. It's been a lot of sun, been a lot of snow, a lot of cold rain. And I got a break, just a brief break. And so I dashed out of Medford over Sisicue Pass, which always has snow. And then uh, through Sacramento and then up over Donner Pass, which is higher. And it was snow, a lot snow all over everywhere up there. This is seven seventy five hundred 7,500 feet, lots of snow. But I went through on a clear day, so I had no snow, no ice, no precipitation. But then oddly, as soon as I dropped down into northern Nevada, I ran in snow all the way to uh, from Reno to Tonopah on 95. Um, and I ran into snow almost the whole way. It was so warm, it would never stuck to the road. Uh, there's a lot of traffic on 95, and uh, it never stuck on the road at all. So it wasn't dangerous to me because it was during the day, a lot of traffic. But yeah, uh, it's hard to avoid the snow. Now, if I had continued down five, Interstate five, uh, once you get south of Redding, Redding is the very base of the foothills of Sisicu Pass, where you will run into almost always run into snow. You're going to be required to have chains in the winter. Uh, very risky over Sisicu. You just never know. Um, on I-5, uh, and, and, you know, or if you come down off of 80 or 84, no, it'd be 84, coming off 84 out of Seattle area, uh, you're going over all kinds of passes. You're going to go through Salt Lake City, and there's general, I'd plan to go to Salt Lake City because uh, there was someone there I wanted to shoot a video, and it was going to be in the teens, and I didn't want to camp in the teens, so I avoided it. I really wanted to make it all, make it back this spring. Uh, anywhere else but on the coast, the coast uh, is going to almost rarely get snow. It, it'll be rainy a lot and unpleasant a lot. 
but not snow. And um, and I can't tell you anything about the East Coast. I can't even begin to help you there. Um, if you take I-5 south of Redding, you won't run into snow. It'd be very unusual. That's low country, a couple hundred feet, five 500 feet maybe, no more than 1,000. And uh, you won't run snow. You have to, to get to Quartzsite, you would go all the way down 5 or 99, either one, and then cross over at Tehachapi. And Tehachapi is high enough. You could see, I've seen it snow, and I've definitely been at Tehachapi Pass when it snowed, but that's rare. And you could go all the way down to San Diego and take eight across, and you're not going to see any snow down there. So, yeah, you got a good plan. Anywhere else, snows, you just got to dash through it when you've got a good weather forecast. Cedric Fisher, how do people keep their waste tanks from freezing? I don't know. I had never owned an RV. I, I lived in an RV in Anchorage, Alaska for one full year in an RV park. I couldn't keep anything from freezing. I gave up. It was 30 below. I lived in Anchorage, Alaska. And at 30 below, it was just a lost cause. And I used the bathhouse. I used the bathhouse all winter. Plus, it warmed up. You know, we had Anchorage gets warm snaps even during the winter when it would all thaw. And I still wouldn't use it because it would refreeze uh, once another cold snap hit. I don't know. I don't know how you do it. I don't. That's one of the. I'm not a fan of RVs, and uh, um, mainly we talk about the vans. But if you're going to be in an RV, I, I don't have an answer for you to how to keep your tanks from freezing. Anonymous, I feel stuck in Williams with all this snow and ice. Yeah, yeah, your Williams is a bad place to be in the winter. How do I get out here with no experience towing a trailer? Well, wait, wait for a break in the weather. Uh, You'll take I-5, not I-5, what are you on? You're on I-40. Um, you'll take I-40, uh, and I would just take it all the way down to uh, to 95 and head south on 95 on, on the Arizona side. Uh, so you're, it's mostly downhill. Williams is at 7,000 feet, and you're going to end up at 1,000 when you cut south. What's the name of the Kingman? Just you take... Uh, it, really, it's just a matter for watching the weather really closely and getting a break when you know there's it's going to be sunny and there's no no snow in the forecast and you're pretty confident in that accuracy of that and uh, that's just how i got from medford to here just waiting for a break in the weather and as soon as there was a break you go there's so much traffic on 95 that it won't ice up if uh the heat of the tires melts it and it's so non-stop with the big trucks and everything it's it's not going to freeze up there um uh, it could get cold enough i mean williams that whole area gets down below zero. If it's below zero, it's going to be ice and snow. But that's why you're waiting for a break in the weather when it's above freezing. And the traffic will keep the road from freezing. And then make a dash then. Sit tight until you get that break in the weather. And then dash down. Once you're to Kingman, once you're most of the way Seligman, once you're past that, you're not real at risk of, of snow and ice anymore. And then from 95, Lake Havasu, Parker, Quartzsite. Uh, no, you won't be issues with snow. Uh, no experience towing a trailer? Well, you're just going to have to learn. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. I, you just have to learn. Uh, but if you wait for the break in the weather, the weather won't be working against you. Rob Reynolds, how do you heat a small car? What type of heat can you use in such a small space? And I don't have an answer, I'm afraid. Um, there is no good answer. People try the Candles with the overturned uh, the ceramic pots. Uh, you could try that. And and it's such a small space. I know people who say it works, that the ceramic heaters or uh, the candle lanterns have two or three or four candle lanterns going, and they're pretty safe and secure, and that even some candle lanterns, of course, you're buying a lot of, you're buying a lot of candles, or the little emergency uh, candles, that might be a way to go, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, the emergency candles are these little cans. They're about like this, and they have three wicks in them, and they'll run even with three wicks. I think they'll go a dozen hours. And the three wicks might put out a lot of heat. And then if you work devise the the plate over them, the, the ceramic terracotta plate over them, uh, that would confine some of the heat down there. You're going to have to have ventilation. They're putting out carbon monoxide. They're putting out smoke. Uh, you'll want to cover it because there'll be soot on whatever you cover it with. And if you don't cover it, it'll be on your car 
the flame puts out soot. It just always, it has to. Um, and so you be careful of that. And you got a real fire hazard. You, you know, you get to bouncing around and watch, not watch what you're doing. And you got a open flame. You could try a stove in there. I would not. I would not try a stove. Uh, it's too small and confined. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, if you had a ton, a ton of solar, which how are you going to have a ton of solar on a car? You could try a little electric heater, you know, the little tiny 400 watts or less, 12-volt heaters, but it's not going to work. Uh, that's not going to do you much good, I don't think. But you could try it. Say you have a 300-watt panel on your roof. And a couple of good, a couple of good batteries. You could try it, see how that works. A better idea is to keep yourself warm, and uh, for that, I would look into a, the twelve volt heating pads. Uh, if you have enough solar and you got enough battery, and you can just run the alternator. If you're charging off the alternator, uh, you can cover yourself with a twelve volt heating pad, and I think that or heating blanket. You know, the they buy the truck stops all have them. Amazon has them. Just Google it. And um, I think that would be keeping yourself warm. Of course, your fingers are still cold. And your fingers have to be outside because you're reading a book or you're typing on a computer. And your nose gets cold and your face gets cold and you're wearing a hat. You know, that's not a good way to live. But you can do it. Uh, you can do it. I just don't know of a good source in a the car. They're just too small. You, what you have to really be careful is the clearances. Because uh, uh, an intense heat, enough heat to make a difference, will catch fire. Well, whatever is too close to it will catch fire. You have to keep the clearances. I just don't have an answer. Uh, I do have an answer, and that's to buy a, a hybrid, a Prius. If you live in a Prius, they're designed to run very, very efficiently on idle. And, and now they have to be on. It's not like the air conditioner, which is electric. Um then you're just drawing off the battery and the engine only comes on to recharge the battery. That works really efficiently. But with heat, uh, even a Prius, the engine creates the heat, just like you're in your car. And so when the engine creates the heat and blows it out, you're using the battery with the blower. Um, and so the engine will run quite a bit more, but they're designed to run a lot more. They're basically a generator, an enormous generator with an enormous battery pack on wheels. And so they're designed to run and you can run, you could keep warm pretty well for not much money in a hybrid, particularly the Prius. Um, and so that is really the only answer that I have. Prius is a remarkably reliable car, cheap to run. Uh, uh, the Prius would be something to really give serious thought to if you had to live one in the winter. They're long. Uh, they're not very tall, but they're very long. You get a surprising amount of stuff in them. Uh, there is no good answer. I'm sorry. I just don't have a good answer if you're living in a car. Keep yourself warm. SB, I don't understand what is a vapor barrier and how it is applied in your van. Um, in most places you live, you're, if you create heat, you've created moisture. There is moist in warm air. Moist warm air has moisture in it. And you've you ever had been in a house with a, a glass of iced tea and put it on a coaster and before long the, the outside of the glass is covered with condensation well how did, how did that happen did someone put, no someone didn't come and pour water on it it's it's a vapor barrier it needs a vapor barrier so warm moist air hits a cold surface whatever the cold surface is in your van it's your walls your van's steel and uh, or a car when a warm moist air it's a cold steel it drops its moisture and now all of a sudden you've got that condensation all over your walls well it's not going away it's not gonna eventually it would it'll dry up but it's gonna drip and run down and it's gonna accumulate on the floor and your walls are gonna be covered with, with um and you're keeping it warm so that's why you have warm air hitting cold walls and so that is a breeding ground for mold and that's the risk with uh with um with with vans is you'll get mold on the walls so the idea behind a vapor barrier every house has a vapor barrier but your house isn't moving and shaking down the road at 80 miles an hour either is it and uh the idea behind a wall a house is so i've built a couple houses so when you put up a wall you've got a long wall of two by fours or two by sixes you take uh, take a big sheet of plastic one long 
continuous sheet and you staple it into the um into the uh uh studs you staple it right into the studs you put the sheetrock or the paneling or whatever you're using on the insides up on top of that and then as the warm moist air passes through it doesn't hit the cold surfaces because that sheet of plastic isn't cold it's warm it's got warm coming into it from the inside of the house and so it never drops its condensation that's what a vapor barrier does the idea in the van is to create a vapor barrier so you'll have your walls you'll have the rid the rim um ribs the ribs of the van and then you put a vapor barrier all the way around so that no warm moist air ever hits the walls and so you don't get condensation the problem in reality is it's impossible to do that and what happens is if you put up, this is my personal opinion, and a lot of people disagree with me. My personal opinion is if you put up a vapor barrier and it does have a flaw, and it will, the warm, um, you just can't create a vapor barrier in a van that's going to stay there and work 100%. Not even half percent is my personal opinion. The warm, moist air is going to get over the barrier. It's going to hit the cold steel. It's going to drop its warm, moist air. And it's going to condense on the walls. You're going to have wall. You're going to have condensation all over the walls, and then the vapor barrier is going to make it harder for it to escape. It will attach it there and keep it there. I think the vapor barrier makes it worse. So either the vapor barrier has to be 100, percent or it has. You should do no vapor barrier, because that midway thing that nearly all of us end up doing the vapor bar barrier in vans, I think makes things worse and gives you more mold. I really do believe that. Um, so my solution for you is that your insulation either just don't do anything and then the warm moist air will hit this wall and then it will, when it warms up, it'll dry out. Now I spent my winter in the desert. The desert isn't hot and moist. Uh, it dry, it's very dry air. Even in the winter, the air here is dry. And so it wants to dry out. So the idea, my idea is that just to let the let either don't put up any insulation, no vapor barrier, and uh, let the let it condense and then let it dry out. It'll just dry out because it's such a dry area. That it will it'll pull it off the wall and it'll dry out. Or another idea, and I think is just as good, is if you take uh, whatever insulation you use has to be attached firmly against the wall. So that the air, the more moist air can't get behind the wall. This is the ideal answer. So use like a half inch sheets of uh, of e EPS. That's the pink or blue styrofoam. Half sheet half inch sheets are pretty flexible. They will curve with your wall. Cut it in between the ribs and spray glue it onto the ribs. Mm -hmm. And to put a couple layers. The the one inch layer won't won't curve. The half inch layer will curve. It will conform to the wall. And then you glue it up on the wall, and then no air or moist air can ever hit the steel wall. It will only hit the insulation, which is warm, and there won't be condensation. That's the answer. The, the insulation is a vapor barrier, and it's flush up against the wall. Even if the wall is curved, it curves up against it, and no warm moist air ever gets behind it. Uh, and then when you put on your final paneling, you, that's why you use two half inch because they'll both conform and then they will both the paneling will hold it up. Most ribs are about an inch. Uh, and so you're filling up the rib. Uh, you will get a little bit of condensation on the rib itself, but as a percentage, that is a very low percentage. And getting a little bit of condensation on that shouldn't be too bad. And in the desert, it will just dry up and won't be a problem. That's probably longer detailed more detailed explanation than you really need but there's a lot of confusion about vapor barriers and what why why you need one and what the pluses and the minuses are uh now on the other hand if when i lived in alaska i lived in this for six years in a in a box van in alaska and i never looked at the uh walls i never took the i insulated heavily but not in the way i described i bet my walls were covered with mold uh because i, I ran heat all winter Anytime you burn fuel, you create heat. Burning fuel, well, of course, it creates heat. It creates moisture. And uh, so if you're running a Mr. Buddy heater or if you're doing like me and you're running your stove, 
you're pumping moisture into the air. You have a lot of warm, moist air. And if it hits the wall, it will condense. And you're going to have a wet wall, and you're going to have uh, uh, mold eventually. And that's the, that's the risk, mold and mildew. So uh, gluing the, the insulation directly to the wall is really the answer in a van. We have a lot of questions. Oh, I know it. I got it. I took, I'm taking so much time. <laughs> uh, what cheap insulation to use in an SUV? Well, you don't have it. It's so hard to insulate these small, small spaces. You know, with a van, the ribs are quite a far apart, and you just cut a, a piece of styrofoam and you press it in. Half inch will conform to the wall. You spray it, you push it in there, and then you put your paneling over it to hold it even more in place, and you're set. Man, with the with you don't have the big gaps between the ribs, and um, I don't have an answer for you. I don't know that I would. I think if I were going to be in an SUV, I just wouldn't even try to insulate it. Uh, this is a huge advantage to a cargo van. So insulate the wall. I would insulate the windows. Uh, cut a piece of uh, styrofoam, half inch styrofoam. That'll make an immense difference. Uh, and put that into the windows, and um, that's about all I would do. Uh, if you got a, uh, you will have, a, I'm sure you'll have a headliner. If you can get a half inch piece of uh, styrofoam up on the headliner, that's the best thing you could possibly do. Uh, or even uh, take the headliner down and get as much insulation across the top as you can. Again, it has to go right up against the metal or you're going to get mold behind it. Um, you're not going to create an airtight vapor barrier. So it's got to be pressed right up against the metal. And that's what I would do. And and then the sides, cover the windows. They're where you'll lose most of your heat. And I just write the rest off. I wouldn't insulate anything else. Uh, Mon Mona and the fur crew gang, I do my best to stay out in winter weather, but there's always a cold front. Uh, other than layering, I know my vehicle doesn't have enough insulation. Other than layering on blankets or sleeping in my zero sleeping is bag, is there anything I can do? You don't say what your vehicle is. I have heavy curtains and foam core cutouts for my windows. You're doing everything right. Uh, if you have the room for to be safe, you can run a, a Mr. Buddy heater. You can get a uh, Olympian catalytic heater. Uh, if So you don't say what your vehicle is. Do you have a van? If you have a van, I would add heat. I would insulate it and add heat. Um, why not? Uh, again, so I'll just go down the list. Real quick list of all the heat types, sources that you can get. Uh, number one, what I'm doing, I'm just running my stove for heat. Um, it works well for me. Again, I'm in the desert where the moisture isn't an issue because it's so dry here. Um, so uh, run a, a stove, a, a little buddy heater, an Olympian, Olympian uh, catalytic heater. Uh, a good, really good source is if you have the room, this is for a van-sized rig, big enough that you can get clearances around the heat source. I've had this happen. I, I once, uh, when I lived in Alaska in my box fan, I came home, from, I came out of the shower. My towel was wet, of course, I'd showered. And I hung it above the, um, above the uh, uh, stove. I had Olympians. I used Olympian catalytic heaters. I ran them year, day, all day, 24 hours a day. Um, and it fell in front of the heater, not even on the heater, but in front of the heater as I left. And the heat hitting the towel dried it out completely really fast. That's why I put it up there. Uh, but it caught fire. And um, and I came home in time to find the fire. And, and so it was just so close enough, and, and it was cloth, to catch fire. Another time, my dog, I had, uh, I had the heater running. My heaters ran 24 hours a day. My dog kicked off Abby. Her name was Abby. Uh, kicked off one of my pillows, and it was just sitting in front of the heater, and it caught fire. Now, it was uh, anti, must have been anti-fire because it never burst into flame, but it was just smoldering and charred. And I don't know what would have happened if I'd left, hadn't come home when I did. So it's really important. Clearances are crucial. And, of course, carbon monoxide is crucial. You've got to have ventilation. Normally, in a van, you open both front windows an inch. That's probably going to be enough. But you can't go wrong by giving yourself too much ventilation. Give yourself plenty of ventilation. 
but but then I'll have them open and I, I won't do any good. Of course, it's going to do good. Those things are pumping out a lot more cold, warm air than that inch up front is going to take away. And uh, so don't worry about that. Don't think that. Just think about ventilation. Without ventilation, you will die. Think that. Um, my, not the most efficient use of heat. Yes. You will die without ventilation. Get enough ventilation. And uh, the same thing if you don't give it the clearances. You will die without clearances. You don't tell me what vehicle you have, so I can't answer your question. If you have a van, I would get a probably buddy heater. I really think the Olympians are far better, but I would get a um, an Olympian. Okay, so going through the heat source, uh, another one is a diesel heater. I think the, the Chinese diesel heaters, I think they're worth spending the money on. Um, I have a video I just put out not too long ago about the Chinese diesel heaters and the I know some people now that have them and installed them. If you're up to doing the install, I think they're worth the effort. I think I would try them if I were you. Uh, and then finally, a wood stove. A wood stove is a very valuable option. Again, you don't tell me the vehicle, so I can't. Obviously, you're not putting a wood stove in a car. Uh, but if you have a full-size extended length van, you could fit a wood stove in there. And that might be something to consider. Uh, it's ideal. You don't get carbon monoxide. Or do you? You probably do. Uh, but if it's vented properly so you don't get smoke, I think you're safe. And, but you don't get that moisture. It's a very dry heat. That's the main thing. Or you can, if you've got a big rig, you could put even an RV furnace in there. I'm not a fan of RV furnaces, but you can put one in. All right. All right. Uh, Gallagher, one of your videos mentioned some kind of custom-made window covers for caravans that just snap into place that are reasonably priced. Can you give us more info on brand name and where to buy them? The only thing I know of like that is uh, if you if you own a Chevy or Ford van or Dodge, I'm pretty sure you can get these for the Dodge vans too. And now they're coming out for the Sprinters, the Rams, and the Transits. Uh, they're they're so popular now you could probably get them made for that too. This isn't even a snap on. It is an it's an outside uh, cover. It's a white vinyl cover it wrap i'm in my van now it wraps around the entire outside and that is a really that's going to help a lot you lose so much heat through these uh and the main reason you want them is in the winter they keep the light out and the heat out uh that's so in the winter they're in this in the summer they're fantastic to keep the heat out but even in the winter i think even that vinyl outside around would keep a lot of warmth in now Passive heating, I'm glad we. I thought of this. Passive heating is very, very important. If you go to the desert, uh, it was cold here last night. I don't think it was freezing, but it was in the 30s. Um, and But if you will point your van into the sun, uh, due south, so that the sun tracks shining in in the winter. This is only in the winter. In the, in the summer, you would do the opposite, due north. But in the winter, you'll get all this sun coming in through all this glass up front. And that will really warm the van up. It will warm the things in the van up. And then you will have thermal mass. Thermal mass is very important. So the heat coming in through the windshield will warm up all the stuff inside. It'll go into the back. It'll warm up the stuff in the back. And then overnight, all this stuff that absorbed heat will slowly release it and let go of it. That's thermal mass. That's thermal heating. That's passive solar heating. You can build whole houses out of passive solar heating and do a remarkable job. Uh, so while well, you park is very important, park your nose into the due south, catch all that sun, and as soon as the sun goes down, you're not getting a viable amount of heat on it, cover them up so the heat doesn't just pass back through. And that's how you would do it. You would use uh, one of these covers. Also, I have a friend who found a, um, for the cars, these are, those are made specifically, they're designed to fit around uh, Ford, Dodge, Chevy, and uh, they're basically designed for RVs van, with van noses. And so you can go buy an Amazon. I've got videos about them. I love these things. They're great in the summer. They're great in the winter. So after the sun's starting to set, no more heat coming in from the sun, cover your front windshield. You'll keep that heat, more heat inside. Cover everything up. I've got a blanket. I won't go back and show you, but I've got a big, heavy blanket doubled over that I pull down and keeps a lot of the heat in back. And then the outside cover here helps. Uh, and then you'll use Reflectix on the windows. A better idea is to get some, uh, go to Home Depot, any hardware store, buy some sheets of um, uh, 
it's called e the best kind is EPS. It's the blue one or the, the pink one. Different brand names are exactly the same stuff. Um, half inch and three quarter, one inch, whatever, whatever you can get. Cut it exactly to fit inside your windows. And man, that will really make a difference overnight. Um, and then Reflectix is always a great thing. If you're if you have a heat source, the Reflectix will bounce that heat source back in. Reflectix is a very good insulator in that case. It has very little value if you have no heat source. Okay, man, I better move on. Uh, that's the only window cover that I know of that I do use. And a friend just showed me, uh, oh, I just put out a video called The 10 Best Things. And I'm pretty sure we covered this. It was thicker. It was silver on the outside and on the inside. But it seemed to have some real insulation in the middle. And it was cloth. And that's what you she's covering her car with. And I bought one because I liked it so much. Uh, and I think that would really serve to insulate outside. I'm not sure how it's going to hold up in the weather and the wind and the rain. The vinyl holds up extremely well against both sun, wind, and rain. So I love the vinyls, and I've got one right here, and I'll put it up in the, in the summer and in the winter. Um, but this thing is much thicker, and I think it'll do a much better job of keeping cold in, uh, heat in and cold out. You can go and look at that 10 gifts for Christmas that I just put out in the last month. I live in extreme cold. I want to know what to expect and how to prepare for van life. How hard is it to keep a van warm in minus 10 weather? Well, like I said, I have done it. I've kept a van warm at, uh, routinely at minus 30. Uh, it takes a lot of heat source, and you got to keep the heat in once you create it. 10 below zero. Anytime the temperature gets below zero inside a van, you can feel it creeping in. It's almost like a living thing. And it just, you can feel feel it creeping in through the walls it just seeps in and i ran olympian and i recommend olympian as now these didn't exist when i back in these days this was in 95 i, I lived in anchorage alaska in a van from 95 to 2001 i would give very serious thought to one of the chinese diesel heaters if you have the money buy the real thing i think a webestos webestos is one of them and there's another it's an e it's a german company uh that make the real thing they're like a thousand twelve hundred dollars and so the chinese have made clones for a couple hundred dollars um if you can afford the real thing buy the real thing they're going to be far better uh but if you can't i would definitely these these chinese are 150 200 bucks and if it lasts you a season and you throw it away I think that's well worth it. And they'll run off diesel. They make some, mainly they're diesels. Uh, if you don't have a diesel, and you can tap right into your tank if you can. Um, if not, you, they make gas ones. Gas is so much more flammable. I'd be very reluctant to have a gas one. But diesel, you know, diesel just doesn't want to explode on you. It'll burn up, kill you. The diesel is kind of hard to get to ignite. And uh, so I definitely recommend the diesel heaters. They come with a gas tank you can mount somewhere, and you can just, I think they're, Two, three, four, five. I've got a video. Go look at the video. Don't, I won't try and explain it to you. If I were going to live in extreme cold again, I'd get the diesel heater. That's exactly what I'd do. Or a wood stove. I'd give very serious thought to a wood stove because you get the dry heat. Um, yeah. The great thing about the diesel heaters, any vented heater, is it vents the exhaust outside. So the warm, moist air goes outside with the exhaust, no carbon dioxide inside. Unless you've installed it wrong. And then any appliance, any heating appliance you install wrong will kill you. Just know that. You've got to install them right. But if you install it right, it's 100% safe. So um, install right. They're very safe. And the, the warm, moist air goes outside. Eliminate, should eliminate the problem with mold. Your body puts out a lot of moisture, but shouldn't be too big an issue because you're keeping it warm. Yeah, if I were going to be in extreme cold, I would definitely go with one of those heaters. Got to move on. Card two. Oh, man, I'm out of time. Have you seen the new Mr. Buddy Flex? It's a portable heater, and you can also cook on it. It's about $160. Happy New Year from Cleveland. It caught my eye, and I looked at it, and no, I, there, it's not a good idea. I, it's a bad idea, and I can't remember now why it's a bad idea. I looked at it and thought, well, finally, something new and great that we can all latch on to, and I looked into it. The Flex is it doesn't use its own propane. You hook onto another one. I, I, when I was done reading about it, I said, this is terrible. No one should buy this. 
And that's all I can remember. I don't remember the details of why I thought that. My Skies 5D. Question, how do we keep the moisture out of our vehicle when using propane heater inside? You can't. It just isn't. The only way to keep that moisture out um, is with, uh, again, I think in the desert, it's no big deal because it's so dry um, that it's not a problem. But if you're anywhere else but the desert, then it's an enormous problem and you can't keep it out. And then I would look, think seriously about a wood stove if you have a big enough vehicle and think really seriously about one of the diesel heaters. Buy, the, buy a real one if you can. Brand name, I forget what the brand names are. If someone will write in and tell me the brand names, that would be a good thing. Uh, so I can, I should just remember them and things are easy. It's easier to say I'll remember than actually do it. Okay, uh, move on. Uh, you can't keep it out. It's going to be hot. It's going to be moist in there. I, I talked at length about condensation. Go back and rewatch this later for that conversation. What are your thoughts on a wood stove in a van or tent? I'm a fan. In fact, I'll just let you know, I have just bought two teepees. And with one of them, I bought a wood stove and I'm going to test them. I have two people already who are going to take them. One of them will get the wood stove and uh, we're going to test teepees. One is a canvas how much did I pay for that thing? I can't remember how much I paid for it. It was either twelve hundred or twenty two hundred. I think it was twelve. I think I was wrong. I think it was twelve hundred. Might have been twenty two. I can't remember. It was a um, tent TP by Mansfield Outdoors. It looks like a great canvas TP, and so we're going to try it. And I also bought a Lux L U X E. Nylon TP, I think they're great TPs, but the sun's going to kill it. And if you're just spending trips in one of these, I would buy the Lux, I think, because the sun's not going to kill it. But if you set this thing up 30, 100, 365 days a year, the sun's going to kill it. This nylon, nylon just can't stand up to, to the sun and the rain and the wind. It's not going to hold up. But I wanted to prove that. That's just my personal opinion I just gave you. We're going to set them both up. One person is going to live in them year round, and we're going to find out a, a nylon versus canvas. Is it worth that extra money? Uh, they, but they're they're big enough. They're both seven man. They're pretty big. You can they'll sleep seven. That's very optimistic. They'll sleep two and a dog and all your gear very comfortably, and three or four pretty comfortably, and your gear and a dog maybe. Uh, so they're big tents. Uh, they're I think they're like nine or ten feet tall at the top. And I bought a wood stove. They both are have wood stove jacks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a fan of. Uh, and, and if you would like to try a wood stove in your van, uh, I'd be willing to buy a wood stove for you to try. So contact me at CRVL Interviews. And if you have the skills and the room, and you're going to mess with it, it's a commitment. I'm not just giving you a wood stove because I'm a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy. I want to. I'm a nice guy and that I want to help people live their best lives in as nomads. And the way I can do that is actually test things. So I will buy you. Thank you, Casey. You're really sharp. <laughs> that's where the, uh, that's where the, um, you write to, if you're interested in a wood stove, uh, for in your van or trailer, uh, or write me and let me know, I might be willing to uh, set you up with one to test. Uh, Valerie from Oregon, when does quartzite start staying warm at night? Well, for the most part, it's warm, but it has cold snaps, and the cold snaps are in the 30s. But warm is 40s. Uh, is, would you agree with that, Sue Ann? Most of, the, most of the winter, it's in the 40s, and then a cold snap is in the 30s. So compare that to Minnesota <laughs> or Canada or Alaska or Oregon. Uh, or Washington and Medford is kind of in the, I was slept cold. I was bundled up. I sleep in my van at my mom's. I love my van. I love my bed, my bed in my van. So I slept in my van every night and man, I was bundled up, uh, really bundled up. It gets pretty cold there. Uh, so for the most part, uh, I think it's warm enough. And then the cold snaps, you got to be ready for them and have a method to stay warm in them. Uh, 30s, maybe really unusually into the 20s at night. That's pretty unusual. Uh, when does it start warming up? January and February, where we'll both have cold nights. 
By March, you should be done with the cold nights. But the last couple of winter of winters, the cold stayed an unusually long time. So it's hard to, for me to give you an exact time, but um, by March, you should be looking at mostly warm nights. Nicholas Long, I am in the 2012 Chevy Express passenger van. Would you recommend? Would you recommend covering some of the windows with insulation and walls? or just making removable covers for them all. Uh, if you're in a cold place, yeah, you definitely got to cover them because you're losing enormous amounts of of heat right through that glass. It's like nothing. Um, I would personally, if you can do it, you have the money, the skill, I would put, um, I would put up uh, insulation. I'd buy a half inch sheets of uh, EPS, that's the blue and the pink insulation. That's the thickest. That's the best. Not the best per inch, but pretty close to the best. And you can get them, or or even better. Really, what's far better is polyiso. Polyiso is the best. And it's really common to get polyiso with a silver side. So uh, I don't know how thin you can get them, and I don't know how bendable it is. That's why I do recommend EPS more, because I know half inch bends pretty well. It will c c uh, conform to a curved wall. Um, and I don't know that the polyiso will, uh, depends on how thin it is. Uh, but it almost always has a silver side. So then you would push that in, leave the silver side out in the, in the winter, in the, in the winter, silver side into the van and the summer silver side out of the van. And that worked really well summer and winter. Uh, yeah, I would definitely do that. And if not, Reflectix works really well. Uh, I would definitely put Reflectix in it no matter what. Uh, if if you didn't do insulation, uh, cardboard. Well, the cardboard will, or or I tell you what, I never have done it. And I don't know if I know anyone who's done it, but something to think seriously about is uh, coroplast. Coroplast is plastic cardboard, um, corrugated cardboard, but it's plastic. It's not. There's no paper. It won't. You could pour it out in the rain and it won't dissolve. Uh, and you get the you get the insulation channels of the corrugation. And um, you can buy it. You can buy it pretty often. It's what uh, yard signs are made out of. You know, if you've ever seen a political sign, vote for Joe. Um, it was almost certainly printed on Coroplast. And it, it's very durable and it's tough. And I think it would have some insulation value. And I would want to get two or three or four layers of it to make it really accomplish anything. But it would last forever. And it's really easy to work with. You can cut it with scissors, mold it in there. I think I would think about Coroplast. Maybe that would end up being more than insulation probably would be um i don't know something to think about but worst comes to worse just use it just use cardboard two three layers of cardboard and and wrap it with with aluminum foil uh and spray paint one of them black or uh glue spray glue on uh black flannel and i think that would give you a lot of good insulation it's practically free uh so that's something to think about too okay oh i don't think i was done with that one what are your thoughts on a wood stove? One does quartzite. I guess I was done with that. One. Card three. Uh, you want to I, go over because of, of announcements? Yeah, I go so long on announcements. We'll go okay. over, folks. Uh, can you use uh, Stuart Forsyth? Can you use expanding foam for awkward spaces? No. And I haven't got absolute proof of this. Um, and I've tried to find it, but it is my understanding. And so uh, that's why I said so firmly no. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the great, great stuff is a spray foam. Uh, you buy it at Home Depot and you, you you spray it in around your windows and it expands. And then once it's expanded, you can just take a knife and cut it. So the overflow is gone. Great stuff is great stuff. But it is my understanding, and I could be wrong. I can't find proof of this. I've looked. Uh that it causes rust on metal, severe rust on metal. And uh, and by forum, we've had a lot of conversations and people have come in with uh, said, I thought great stuff would work really great for it. So I sprayed it in and they had a before picture and then a month or six months or a year later, and it's just covered with rust. So uh, I've seen enough anecdotal evidence, not direct scientific evidence, that makes me think you should not use them. And of course, it works great in house construction because you're putting it into vinyl and you're putting it into wood 
or you're putting it into painted steel door, maybe around the door jam. And even that's nearly all wood. Uh, and this doesn't harm wood, but it rusts metal. So to the best of my knowledge right now, without any hard scientific proof, uh, do not use those. They will cause you rust. Um, autumn skies. I'm curious. I've seen people insulate and put up walls and floors. Yeah. My question is, what are they attached to? Are you punching through into the metal? Yeah, you want to. You want definitely want to attach it into the metal. Uh, that's why I love a cargo van. That's why I live in a cargo van because when you move into a cargo van, there's nothing on the walls. You're looking at the ribs. You, you know, you got this long piece of sheet metal all the way up and down a van, but it's attached to something, and they just I think they spot weld it onto the ribs and there's a rib that goes all the way around the two sides and up and around and it's the structure you got to have a structure and so it's perfectly fine uh, if you know once you know where the ribs are to screw your um so i screwed my paneling right into the ribs and uh i made a diagram i knew where all the ribs were once they were covered you can't see them anymore can you and that's the problem with the passenger van you don't know where the ribs are and if they got all these windows well then well, they have to be in between the windows. Depends on how many you have. But, uh, yeah, that makes it a lot harder in a passenger van. You can't find the ribs. You don't know where they all are. Uh, and it's covered with all this plastic. You can't see any of the metal on a passenger van, usually. And so that's a pain. Uh, that's a real pain as far as I'm concerned. That's why I, I buy cargo vans to convert because you see the ribs. Once you see the ribs, do a diagram out so that when they're covered, you can still know where they are. And then when I attach, build walls, build furniture, build shelving units, I screw right into the rib, and I know I'm safe. And of course, you got to use the right size screw if you're attaching a three quarter inch screw piece of plywood, say, to a, a a rib. Well, then you have to know to go through the three eighths inch plywood, a little and a half inch beyond that, and that's probably going to be plenty. So you'd have to have a three eighths and a half inch. Uh, not a three, it's most three quarter. I'd probably be using a three quarter and a half inch. Um, so that'd be an inch and a quarter screw. And you'd use sheet metal screws. Personally, I use self tapping uh, with with hex heads. You'll find hex heads all over my van. Uh, that's what I usually use to attach. That's how you do it. Um, oh. I, I, there was a repeat question on that. We're on card four. Oh, A G T W N C. Uh, hey, Bob, question. Why does my air mattress lose air when it's cold? I have three brand new ones and they all go flat while I'm sleeping. <laughs> uh, let me let me clarify uh, what you mean by an air mattress. If you mean an air mattress, the $30 thing you buy at Walmart to throw down on your floor in your apartment, uh, don't buy that. <laughs> okay, don't buy that. It's going to be cold. It's going to be miserable. They're gonna, it's going to break. Uh, don't buy that. It's cheap. Uh, I sleep on and strongly recommend backpacking self-inflating pads. That's the description. They're designed for backpackers, and they're self-inflating. They'll have valves on both ends. No, no, that's not always true. Sometimes it's only one valve. Mine has two valves. Um, and you open the valve, and uh, it will self-inflate. It will just slowly re-self-inflate. And they have insulation in them. And that's the key thing, is that they have insulation in them. So if you're sleeping on a standard house air mattress, there's no insulation in there. It's just air. And there's no insulation around it. So whatever the temperature is around the air mattress is going to be the temperature inside the air mattress because there's no insulation. And so uh, if you're sleeping in the winter in the cold and it's 40 degrees inside your van, the air in that air mattress is going to be 40 degrees. And when you lay down on top of it with no insulation, your body heat is just sucked out of you wherever it touches it into that. And it's very cold. I don't know why it loses air. It's probably just got a slow leak. Uh, that shouldn't be an issue. That's just a slow leak, and I don't have an answer for that. But don't buy these things. Buy these self-inflating backpacking pads. Mine's a thermarest. Thermarest is the oldest. I think they kind of invented the things, but there are tons of brands and they're all good. I'm not saying Thermarest is better, so buy it. Uh, REI -E probably is the best bang for buck. 
because REI makes high quality products. Um, and you can go to REI.com to find REI. They'll have their own brand name. They'll be a little bit cheaper. They'll be just as good a quality. That's the thing. But a big Agnes is another name. I bet all, I think all of them make them. Nemo is becoming a big name in outdoor gear. These are quality products. If you're out on a one month hike, you can't have your, your, your air mattress going, dying on you. It's got to be tough. These are tough things made to endure. And I sleep on a Thermarest Mondo King. It's four inches tall. It's, uh, my, they have them different sizes. Mine is 36 inches wide and six feet, 72 long, I believe. I'm only five eight, so that's plenty. Uh, and it's fantastic. It is fantastic. And they'll self-inflate a little ways. And most people then have to open them up and puff, give it a little more air. I generally have to, to get it as comfortable as I want. But if you want to sleep hard, then you puff more air and you make it hard. If you want to sleep soft, you open the valve and just let it seep down on it. And then you close it and you try that. And if it's not soft enough, you let more out. You put more in. You can make it as hard or as soft as you want. They're full of insulation. They are completely warm. You'll never be have cold underneath you. Uh, and one of the problems with mattresses is your warm, moist air on a foam mattress goes right through that. And then it condenses. We talked about condensation a lot. There's no vapor barrier here. And so the warm, moist air goes through the foam and then hits that cold plywood underneath and condenses. And then you've got a moist spot. And then eventually you've got mildew on your foam. I've seen that. I've had that. That's all the time. Uh, and But that's the beauty of a thermarest is it's a vapor barrier. The vapor can't get below it. It hits. It's kind of a plastic nylon thing. But I find it very, very comfortable. And if you spill on it, you don't care. I mean, I, I do all my work. I sit on my mattress all day. That's where I lounge and work. It's my office and my recliner. It's everything to me. I sleep on it. I lounge on it. I work on it. Uh, and um, it's waterproof. And so if I spill something on it, I just wipe it off. Uh, it's everything. It has all the advantages. They're expensive. The Mondo King is the biggest and the best. And I think it was like two hundred to two hundred and fifty dollars, but you can buy you can buy them. I think Thermarest has a luxury model they call it, and it's like two or three inches, and it's hundred hundred and fifty. And you get them in different lengths, and the bigger, of course, the the uh, bigger and wider it is, the more expensive they are. But they're fantastic. I really recommend them. Uh, that's the only thing I recommend. I, that's my number one choice for something to sleep on. They'll last you forever. SCS diesel heaters in a minivan. Do they put out smoke in one stealth park with a diesel heater? That's a good question. Thanks. No, they're vented. They're vented heaters. That's the big thing. They have a combustion chamber. They they come, if you have a diesel vehicle, you can tap right into the diesel tank and you never have to have tank out, diesel fuel outside of the gas tank um, if you know how to do that. Uh, and if not, they will all come with a diesel uh, uh, tank. I think it's Two, three, four, five gallons, and you mount it somewhere on the outside. Diesel is not really explosive. That's the beauty of diesel. Uh, it's not like the vapor, the gas barriers from the vapors from gas, which is highly, highly explosive. Uh, and so it's really a different, different ball game. And so, no, they have a combustion chamber, and it burns, and then it is vented outside. So you're gonna have to cut a, a hole in the side of the van. It'll, you'll put a cover on it and it will vent outside and it, it has an electric fan. It has a, 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 um, a thermostat. You, you move it up and down with a thermostat and um, they're good. They're really, really good. The Chinese diesel ones are clones of these really expensive. Did anyone ever come up with a name for the, the good expensive ones? I'm pretty sure one of them is we best dose. Did, no, does anyone know the other one? They really are the clone one. It starts with E and it's German. I forget. Oh, my dog wants in. A uh, poor guy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the diesel heaters are great. The diesel heat. I'm not a bad, well, never a bad mouth diesel heater. You've got to install it. But I've got a video. I've got a video put out with Lex, my friend Lex, who did it herself. And you can do it. You can do it. I promise you can do it. And um, 
So, well, I can't promise you that. For, forget everything I just said. That wasn't, I wasn't thinking. I don't promise you could do it. I don't think I would do it. Uh, but you can hire someone to do it. Uh, and if you don't want to do it, then don't. But the diesel heaters are very good. And that's the thing. The carbon monoxide and the moisture goes out of the van. There will never be smoke. If you got smoke in the van from a diesel heater, evacuate. You're about to blow up because they're not supposed to be there. Uh, Ebestos? Is it this one, Bob, on the screen? That's it. Eber, Esper. Esper. The other one is Esper. I don't know what that is, but it's probably Esper and their German name or something. E S P E R or A R. And they're going to be a thousand bucks, twelve hundred bucks. They became famous with the Volkswagen crowd. And uh, they can be mounted almost anywhere. And I think the Volkswagen crowd, they're the ones that made them famous. They would band together and, and import them from Germany back when. Uh, you know, when importing things from Germany was expensive. So they'd go together and buy a dozen of them as a group. And then they would talk about them. They made them famous, the Volkswagen groups. And uh, I, I think a lot of them mounted them under the front seats, if memory serves. Oh, I follow a, a, a nomadic couple called Van Wives. And they put one in their Sprinter. And I believe it's mounted underneath the front passenger seat. Uh, yeah, they're great. They're great. They're 1200 bucks. That's why people buy the clones. and. I think the clones are okay. If it lasts you a year and you have to throw it away, 150 bucks for heat for a year, that's pretty cheap. I'm probably going along with that. Okay, I'm going to stop. It's 315. Um, yeah. Do you want to look at any on card five from the live chat? Well, I was thinking, uh, let's do this again next week. Let's Because there's so many more than I'm getting to. What do you think about doing another one on heat and cold? There's a lot okay. of interest in this. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, we'll do this again. We have these questions. Uh, uh, I'll answer. I'll do these again because this is a, a big topic and I, I do get carried away. I think it's important to know the reasoning. What is a vapor barrier? Why is it important? Why doesn't it work? What would you have to do? Maybe you're smarter than I am and the rest of us. And These are the problems. And if you know the problems, this thing, you can think of a whole new solution. Um, but so I think it's, I love knowing and understanding things, the puzzling it out. And I enjoy that more as much as I know the ant. I like to know the answer. I like to, I like to be able to share all of it with you. And I know it's long, boring explanation sometimes, but uh, hopefully you learned something from it. Okay. We're going to stop my dogs. <laughs> oh yeah. Let me say that again. Here's the, uh, let me, two, two things I'm going to do while we have bubbles playing along. Uh, I'm going to start doing tour and uh, and uh, interviews with people. And if you want in quartzite over the course of the winter, if you will write to me at crvlinterviews at gmail.com, someone will write you back. We'll set up a time. And there will be times when I won't be there. There will be times when I'm too busy. and But we'll set up over time. I'm going to plan to be doing this now through March and April. And so if you know you're going to be there in March, uh, let us know. We'll just kind of pencil you in that far off, but really just close. Uh, and so we'd, I'd love to do an interview with you. i got to build up 52 uh, for the coming year. i like to build them all up. C-R-V-L interviews at gmail.com. And also don't forget, uh, both Sue Ann and I are going to be camping, and you can come camp with us at the end of January and I'll put out a video on mine coming up and so on. Okay. I think I'm done. That's all I'm going to talk about. My voice is going on me. Okay. <laughs> there, there are the bubbles. There are bubbles, everyone. Uh, so I hope you got something out of this. I hope there was uh, good information in there that you can, you can make use of. And maybe what I found is over the years of figuring things out, it's you learn a little piece here and a little piece there. And before long, you start to put together the puzzle. And that's what I try and do. So I probably gave you way more information that you needed. But if you can remember some of it, and in the future, it will fall a piece of the puzzle that falls into place. And that's the good thing about having a long-term teaching relationship. Because that's the way most of us learn. 
the pieces slowly start to fall into place. And that's how solar, that's how I learned solar. It took me years, but I learned a little bit and a lot of it I didn't understand. And then the little bit of started by, that I didn't understand made sense suddenly and fit into the puzzle. And so I hope that will be something I can do for you. All right, I'll stop. If you got anything out of this video, uh, like us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, hit that thumbs up button, and we'll talk to you later. Bye now.